everyone, this is Pastor Apostolos. So wonderful to see you this Sunday. Thank you for inviting me to your home this morning. Well, who knows what day this coming Wednesday is? That's right, it's Thanksgiving Day. Here in Australia, of course, we do not really celebrate Thanksgiving Day. It is mainly a holiday that is celebrated in America and Canada. So how did the tradition of Thanksgiving start? Well, it is commonly believed that the first American Thanksgiving Day took place in Plymouth, 1621, when a group of English settlers shared a feast with the native Indians to thank God for a bumper harvest after a harsh winter. But actually, that is not the first Thanksgiving Day. The first Amer American uh, Thanksgiving Day that is recorded took place in the colony of Jamestown, Virginia, 1610, more than 11 years earlier. And it wasn't a feast, it was a prayer service held at the end to a horrible year. That year, known as the starving time, saw the majority of the population die from starvation due to a severe drought and besiegement by the local Indians. There was so little food that the colonists had to eat horses, rats, cats, snakes, even their own shoes in order to survive. And when even those ran out, they had no choice but to eat the flesh of dead human bodies. Of the original 409 settlers, only 60 managed to survive. And the survivors prayed desperately for help, not knowing when or how it might come. Well, in May 1610, their prayers were finally answered when a supply ship from England arrived carrying another year's worth of provisions. And to thank God, the entire colony held a Thanksgiving prayer service. And that is how the first Thanksgiving Day started. And ever since then, Thanksgiving Day has been that time of the year where people thank God for his blessings. Well, like those early settlers in Jamestown, we've also have had quite a horrible year, haven't we? Haven't we? But God has been good to us. Recently, we heard the great news that two vaccines have passed stage three clinical trials with a 90% effectiveness rate against COVID-19. If all things go smoothly, there will, most, uh, the, there will most likely be a vaccine made available to the public by early next year. Now, of course, we don't know for sure whether these vaccines will definitely work, but it does look promising, doesn't it? Should we not thank God? Should we not thank God for keeping us safe and healthy throughout this pandemic? Should we not thank God for letting us live in a prosperous and peaceful nation as Australia, and that our nation has fared much better during this COVID crisis compared to a lot of other countries. These are all blessings from God. So today we are going to hold a Thanksgiving service to thank God for all of his blessings towards us. Now, of course, there is no Thanksgiving Day in the Bible. But Thanksgiving is certainly a huge theme throughout the Bible. After God delivered the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, for example, he instituted two annual Thanksgiving feasts. The first was the Feast of Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks, celebrated in Lake Spring to thank God for the start of the wheat harvest. The second was the Feast of Tabernacles, 
had celebrated in late autumn to not only thank God for the start of the fruit harvest season, but also to remember how God provided for his people during those years of wandering in the wilderness. And the longest Thanksgiving feast that is recorded in the Bible is the dedication of the Lord's temple under King Solomon. And that is what I want to look at today. But just to give you a bit of historical background before we dive into the passage, this event took place after King Solomon finished building the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. The temple took 20 years to build. And it was one of the most magnificent buildings in the ancient world. And it became the center of Judaism. It was the designated place where the Israelites went to worship God and offer their sacrifices. So you can imagine what a big occasion it must have been when this temple finally got built. So let us now read what happened at that temple dedication ceremony. So if you have your Bibles, please take it out and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verses 1 to 10. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verses 1 to 10. And I'll be reading from the NIV version. How about you read along with me? When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, His love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their positions as did the Levites with the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for praising the Lord and which were used when he gave thanks, saying, His love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets and all the Israelites were standing. Solomon consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord. And there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the fellowship offerings, because the bronze altar he had made could not hold the burnt offerings, the grain offerings and the fat portions. So Solomon observed the festival at that time for seven days, and all Israel with him, a vast assembly, people from Lebo Hamath to the Wadi of Egypt. On the eighth day they held an assembly, for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days, and the festival for seven days more. On the twenty-third day of the seventh month he sent the people to their homes, joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for his people, Israel. Well, what a celebration. That festival had everything, didn't it? It had lots of people and lots of food. It had music. It had pomp and fanfare. There was even a fireball literally coming down from the sky and the Lord's glory filled the temple. Never has there been a celebration like it in world history. And the whole purpose of this festival was to thank God for the completion of the temple. And from this passage, I would like us to look at two questions today. First, how do we thank God? And second, why should we thank God? particularly with our finances. First, how do we thank God? How did Israel express their thanksgiving to God? Well, from Israel's example, we see that we can thank God in three ways. 
through our words, through our works, and through our wealth. The first way we can thank God is through our words. What do we teach our children to say from a young age when someone gives them a gift? Say thank you, isn't it? Saying thank you when someone gives you a gift is common manners. We all know that to not say thank you is rude. Well, if there is one person that we should say thank you to, it is God. Because everything we have comes from God. The house you live in, the food on your table, the air you breathe, your family and friends, your job, the world we live in, your very life. All these come from God. Acts chapter 17 verse 24 to 25 says, God made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Should God not be the first person that we say thank you to? Because without him, you wouldn't even be alive. When the Israelites saw God's glory fill the temple, verse 3 says, They knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, His love endures forever. The Israelites praised God's character. I've had many people tell me that they do not know how to pray. Well, here is a simple model for you to follow. Think of five good things that God has given you. And then thank God for those. For example, I thank you, God, for loving me. I thank you, God, for forgiving my sins. I thank you, God, for providing for all my needs. So on and so on. It's really not that hard. If you know how to thank people, you know how to thank God. But the Israelites didn't just thank God with their words. They used music as well. In verse 6, we see the priests and Levites blow their trumpets and play their musical instruments as they sang, His love endures forever. Do you like music? Most people do. Maybe you like to listen to music as you drive or catch public transport or you like to sing as you shower. If you like music, you can use music to worship God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19 says, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the word always here. We are not to thank God sometimes or most of the time or when we feel like it. We are to thank God always. And what are, we to, what are we to thank God for? For everything. Everything you go through in life can be turned into thanksgiving. For example, right now, as you are watching this ch- church service, you can thank God for that. Thank God that you have internet and a computer or mobile phone that allows you to take part in this online church service. Thank God that you have a a comfortable sofa and a roof over your heads as you watch this video. Let me ask you, how many times did you thank God this week? Did you thank God every day? What good things has God given you that you have not thanked Him for yet? Why not take a few minutes now to thank God for all of His blessings towards you? You can pause the video to do that and then resume it after you've finished thanking God. The second way we can thank God is through our works. The Israelites spent 20 years building the temple. Why did they build the temple? Well, building the temple was actually not King Solomon's idea. It was his father, King David's idea. One day, as King David was resting in the fine palace that he had built himself for himself, he thought to himself, Hey, that's not right. 
I am living in a luxurious palace here while the ark of God remains in a tent. And so King David wanted to build a temple for God to dwell in. In the end, King David did not get to build the temple because the Lord said to David, Thanks for the gesture, David, but I do not need a house to live in. You will not be the one to build my temple. Rather, it will be your son Solomon who will build it. Why did King David want to build a temple for the Lord, though? Because he wanted to express his gratitude to God. He recognized that all of his wealth and all of his successes came from God. And so he wanted to do something to show his appreciation to God. As the saying goes, action speaks louder than words. Saying a mere thank you to God uh, is good, but not enough on its own. We must back up our words with action. Let me ask you, what have you done to thank God? King Solomon built a temple to worship God. Do we Christians also have a temple to build? Well, yes. Not a physical one, of course, but a spiritual one. The church is the new temple. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19 to 22 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to build, become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. In the New Testament era, the church the corporate gathering of believers has replaced Solomon's temple. So what have you been doing to build God's temple? Are you just attending church? Or are you actively involved in helping your church to grow? Are there roles in your church that you could be serving in? Have you been inviting people to your church? If you are grateful to God, then Show it by working to build God's temple. So we thank God with our words. We thank God with our works. And third, we thank God with our wealth. Verses 4 to 5 says, Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. Someone calculated that to sacrifice this many animals, it would have, uh, they would have had to slaughter 20 animals per minute for 10 hours a day for 12 days straight. That's a lot of livestock. And you have to understand that in the ancient world, Cattle and sheep were the main source of wealth. According to one source, the value of a bull in those days was the equivalent of 300 US dollars per head, or three days worth of wages. If that is true, then 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and cattle, uh, sheep and goats, would have been worth about 42.6 million US dollars according to my calculations. That's a lot of money. And this was not all financed by the government, by the way. Every person contributed to this offering. Here we see that if we are thankful to God for what He has given us, we will demonstrate it by offering God a portion of our finances. In the Old Testament Tithing, that is giving God one-tenth of your earnings, was mandatory for all Israelites. It was prescribed by the law. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 and 32. 
a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod, will be holy to the Lord. Are Christians required to tithe as well? Well, that is a controversial topic that I do not have time to deal with today. But for me, that is not the important question. The important question is, why wouldn't you? If God has given you so much, why wouldn't you give him back one-tenth of what you earn? After all, all that money came from God in the first place. Without God, you wouldn't even have a job, a source of income or money to begin with. Surely giving back to God just one-tenth of what he has given you is not too much to ask. If you are a Christian and you are not tithing, you really have to ask yourself the question, why? Why are you not giving God one-tenth? Well, I can only really think of two plausible reasons. The first is a lack of trust. You worry that you will not have enough for yourself. But what does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 6? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus promises us here that if we put God's kingdom first, he will make sure that all our other needs are met. When we don't give God what belongs to him because we worry about our financial security, we demonstrate a lack of faith that God will provide for all our needs. The second reason why Christians do not tithe is because of a lack of gratitude. Because when people are grateful to someone, they will naturally want to express their gratitude to that person, isn't it? Do you remember the woman who broke an entire alabaster jar of perfume to anoint Jesus' feet? When the, when the Pharisees and disciples saw that, they rebuked that lady for wasting such an expensive jar of perfume. But what did Jesus say? He replied, those who have been forgiven much love much. But those who have been forgiven little, love little. By this, Jesus meant that those who appreciate God's forgiveness will naturally love God more. But those who do not appreciate God's forgiveness will naturally love God less. So how generous we are to God reflects how grateful we are towards Him. That is why the woman was willing to sacrifice an entire jar of perfume to anoint Jesus' feet because she wanted to do something to express her gratitude to Jesus. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were not had little gratitude for Jesus and so they naturally saw that as a big waste. These are the only two reasons that I can think of as to why Christians do not tithe. Either it is due to a lack of trust or a lack of gratitude. Of course, there may be special circumstances where a Christian cannot give 10% even though they want to. But generally speaking, these are the only two reasons why Christians do not tithe. A lack of faith and a lack of gratitude. And the sad fact is, most Christians do not tithe. A Sunday school teacher once asked a class of 10-year-old boys, would you give $1 million to support missionaries? All the boys exclaimed, yes! Would you give $1,000? Again, yes! Would you give $100 to support missionaries then? Once again, the boys exclaimed, yes, we would! Finally, the Sunday school teacher asked, would you give just one dollar to missionaries then? 
Once again, all the boys exclaimed, Yes, we would! One boy, however, remained silent. Johnny, why did you not say yes this time? Clutching at his pocket, the, li the little boy Johnny stammered, Well, I happen to have one dollar. Many Christians are clutching tightly onto their money, just like that little boy, Johnny. They know Christians ought to tithe, just not their own money. Of the three means by which we can thank God, our words, our works, and our wealth, I would say that wealth is the one that most Christians find hardest to do. There are a lot of Chinese churches where the pastors get criticized if they talk about money. But if Jesus talked a lot about money, then pastors must talk about money if they are to remain faithful to their calling. Did you know that there are more than 2,300 verses on money in the Bible? And almost one third of the parables that Jesus taught was on the subject of wealth. It was Jesus' most talked about subject. And it is the second most mentioned topic in the entire Bible. Why does the Bible have so much to say about money? Because God knows that this is the biggest idol for many people that they are not willing to part with. So with the rest of today's sermon, I'm going to give you four reasons why it is important for Christians to thank God with their finances. There are, of course, many reasons why Christians should offer their finances to God, but here are just four reasons that jump out from today's passage. First, as I have mentioned already, giving financially is how we express our gratitude towards God. Helen and I are really blessed in that we receive many gifts from church members uh, all the time. And every time someone gives us a gift, our immediate reaction is to refuse it because we do not want people to waste their money on us. But every time we refuse to accept their gift, the giver becomes unhappy. And so most of the time, we end up having to accept their gift because we don't want to offend them. Why were they so insistent that we accept their gift? Because they wanted to show their appreciation. Uh, it was their way of showing appreciation to us for all the help that we have given them. It's ingrained in our Asian culture, isn't it? When someone gives you a gift or does you a favor, we must return the favor, isn't it? If we understand this social convention when it comes to, when relating to people, why do we not do the same with God? If God has given us so much, should we not give something back to Him? In fact, do you know what is my personal view with regards to tithing? My view is, if we really want to demonstrate our gratitude to God, we should be giving above and beyond 10%. Because 10% is just the baseline for Christians. It is what we owe God. It is what the law prescribes. It is what we should be giving to God. So if we really want to express our gratitude to God, should we not give something additional to the regular tithe? Whenever my wife and I attend the wedding of a very close friend, for example, my wife will always insist that we must give at least $300 as lucky money. Why? Because the unspoken convention when you attend someone's wedding is that the typical amount you should give the wedding couple is $100 to $200. And so my wife's thinking is that if we want to let the wedding couple know how special they really are to us, we should be giving more than what everyone else is giving them. 
to let them know that they are more than a normal friend to us. That is what I learned from my wife because she's much more generous than I am. But she has a point. If how much we are willing to spend on people reflects how much we value them. Do you agree? So if we really want to show our gratitude to God, we ought to be giving more than what the law commands us to. We should be giving above and beyond 10%. Because 10% is merely what we owe God. When we give 10% to God, we do it out of obedience. And when we give from the other 90%, we do it out of love. It demonstrates that we are giving to God not out of obligation, but out of gratitude. If those in the Old Testament who did not have the privilege of knowing Jesus gave 10% out of obedience, should we who do have the wonderful blessing of knowing Jesus not give more than those in the Old Testament? Because we have received so much more from God than they than those living in the Old Testament. In fact, the people in Old Testament actually gave more than 10%. In verse 7 of today's passage, we see that the Israelites gave three types of offering to the Lord. The burnt offering, the grain offering, and the fellowship offering. These were all voluntary sacrifices. In the Old Testament, you see, there were five types of offering uh, in total. The sin offering and guilt offering were mandatory. That is, they were required by the law. But the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the fellowship offering were voluntary. The Israelites were not required to offer them. And they were usually given on top of the regular offerings when people wanted to express their thanksgiving and devotion to God. So what the Israelites offered at the temple dedication ceremony were voluntary sacrifices above and beyond the regular tithe. Well, today we have the opportunity to do the same. We have the opportunity to give an additional offering on top of the regular tithe to demonstrate our gratitude towards God. As 2020 draws to an end, what are you thankful to God for? What, how has God been good to you? If you are thankful to God, have you been giving Him enough to show your gratitude? What would the amount that you have been offering to God say about how much you value God? And if you are not tithing 10%, then that is a good place for you to start. I know 10% might, might sound like a lot to some of you, but if God set 10% as the benchmark for Christians, then He must have done that because He knows that we can afford it. But if even 10% is too much for you, then just do 5%. Start from somewhere at least and make a commitment to offer that amount to the Lord regularly every week. How much you give is not what is important here. What is important to God is your heart behind it. But how much you give to God does give an indication of how grateful you really are towards God. So let me ask you, would your level of giving reflect a grudging heart or a grateful heart? Are you giving to God as little as you possibly can or as much as you possibly can? If you are truly grateful to God, then reflect it in your offering. The second reason why we thank God with our finances is to build His church. Pretty much everything in this world costs money, isn't it? Nothing comes free as the saying goes. And the same goes for building God's church. 
The temple of Jerusalem did not get built out of nothing. It had to be paid for. In chapters 2-4, to four, we read that King Solomon employed 70,000 men as carriers, 80,000 stonecutters, and 3,600 foremen. He imported the finest sadar trees from Tyre and made all the temple furnishings out of gold, silver, and bronze, and the finest linen. The text doesn't tell us how much it cost altogether, but it must have been a phenomenal amount. Without people donating money to this project, the temple would never have been built. Likewise, if we want to build God's church and further the gospel, we must pay for it. Without money, how is a church going to hire pastors and support their living expenses? Without money, how is a church going to send out missionaries to other parts of the world? Without money, how is a church going to pay for the rent or mortgage? Without money, how is a church going to finance evangelistic events and other church activities? We thank God that during this COVID-19 season, we've been able to move our church services online. But did you know that we had to invest thousands of dollars to buy new equipment and software just to make this possible? If church members do not contribute their finances, where is all that money going to come from? Now, of course, you can say, God will provide. Yes, God will provide. He can make money grow on trees if he wanted to. But that is not how God chooses to build his church. Because he has already given every believer the financial means to build his church. As in the parable of the ten talents, God has given every believer a bag of money that he expects a return on when he comes back. Are you the good and faithful servant who made good use of that money to expand God's kingdom? Or are you more like the wicked and lazy servant who buried that money on earthly things? Or are you even worse than that lazy servant? The lazy servant at least gave the master back his money in the end. But many Christians are not even doing that. They are not even willing to give back to God what belongs to God. Many Christians are willing to give their money to God because they think that it is their money. They think that the money belongs to them. But that money is not theirs. It belongs to God. All the wealth that we have is borrowed money. God lent lent us that money so that we would use it to build his church and further the gospel. And God has the right to get all of his money back anytime. The question we should really be asking is not how much of God's money am I, uh, how much of my money am I using for God, but rather how much of God's money am I using on myself? Hattie Weart was a a little orphan girl that wanted to attend Sunday school one day, but she was not. But because there was not enough room, she was not able to join the class. Two years later, this little girl fell ill, and when she sadly passed away in the orphanage, people found a little secret hidden under her pillow. They found a torn pocketbook with 57 pennies in it, all wrapped up in a scrap of paper. And on that piece of paper were the words, to help build the little temple bigger so that more children can go to Sunday school. For two years, that little girl has saved all her money so that she could one day donate it to the church and help make the church bigger so that orphans like her can attend Sunday school. And when the pastor shared this with his congregation, everyone was touched by that little girl's heart. Donations began flooding in to help build a bigger church. The newspapers found out about it and spread the news far and wide. And within five years, that 57 pennies had grown to 250,000 
dollars. Today, in Philadelphia, you will find a great big church called the Baptist Temple. This church is so big that it can seat three thousand three hundred people, and not only that, it has a college attached to it that can、uh, have that can accommodate over one thousand four hundred students, and it has a hospital and. A gigantic Sunday school that is so big, anyone who wishes to come can come and be comfortable. All this started with one little girl and her fifty-seven pennies. So never think that with the small amount that you give God, God cannot do something big with that. The real question is, are you willing to give what you have to build God's church? If you are truly thankful to God, should you not show your appreciation by contributing to a cause that God cares deeply about—the saving of souls? If you are truly thankful to God, then put your money where your mouth is. Use your finances to build God's church and support the work of the gospel. Third, thanking God with our finances. Cultivates joy. Notice how the Israelites felt after they offered sacrifices to the Lord. Were they unhappy that they had sacrificed so much of their hard-earned wealth? Did they feel that they had、uh, they were losing out? No. Verse ten tells us that all the people went back to their homes, joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for His people Israel. They were so joyful and glad that they decided to extend the celebrations for an extra seven days. They didn't want to go home. They wanted to keep giving. Many people think that having money and wealth will bring them happiness, but studies have consistently shown that it is the givers, not the hoarders, who are the happiest people. Let me quote from one psychology study. Studies have shown a link between generosity and happiness. Some studies have found that people are happier when spending money on others than on themselves, and this happiness motivates them to be generous in the future. Giving cultivates joy, and this is even more true when it comes to God. Paul says in Acts chapter twenty, verse thirty-five, "It is more blessed to give than to receive." Do you want to be more blessed by God? Do you want more happiness and joys in your life? Well, be a generous giver towards God. Giving cultivates joy because when we give to God what we have, God gives to us what He has, and overflowing joy that never ceases. And that brings us nicely to. The fourth reason why we should thank God with our finances, because that is how we receive God's blessings. What happened after Solomon dedicated the temple? Well, if you read on, the Lord appears to Solomon and blesses him. He says in says to Solomon, chapter seven, verse eighteen, "I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said." You shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. Solomon gave to the Lord, and the Lord blessed him. So there is a a link between giving and receiving God's blessings. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I'll, I won't speak more on this point because that is our topic for next week. We will look at why it is more blessed to give than to receive. But let me finish with one more Bible passage for you to reflect on: Malachi chapter three, verse eight to twelve. To give you a bit of context, this is what the Lord said to the Israelites when they were not giving to the Lord their tithes and offerings: "Will a mere mortal rob God?" Yet you robbed me. 
But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Do you want God to bless you? Well, give to God what belongs to Him. If you are not giving to God what He deserves, you are robbing God. Why should He bless you? Giving is how we receive God's blessings. And let me tell you, God will always give us more than what we give Him. Because God will never allow Himself to owe anyone. What you give to the Lord, God will always bless you back even more. It may not necessarily be in material or financial terms. That is where those who believe in the prosperity gospel have got it wrong. But it is true that God always blesses those who give to Him. So would you like God to bless you more? Well then increase your giving. And today is your opportunity to do that. Today is your opportunity to thank God with an thanksgiving offering. There are two ways you can do the offering. The first and easiest way is to do it by online bank transfer using your mobile phone or computer. Our church banking details are printed on the screen for you. But if you prefer to do it by cash, then you can go to any Westpac branch and tell the teller that you would like to deposit some money into this bank account. Just give them our church BSB and account number. I believe that if you go to a Westpac branch, they will not charge you any bank fees. But if you were to go to another bank, they may charge you some bank fees. So go to a Westpac branch. Okay, well, let us now take some time to thank the Lord in prayer. And let us use this time to pray about how much we will give to the Lord this Thanksgiving Sunday. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, let us not be stingy towards God, because God has not been stingy towards us. Let us be generous towards God in the same way He has been generous towards us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us through another year. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for keeping us safe and healthy. Thank you for our family and friends and for providing for all our needs. Everything we have comes from you. And today we would just like to use our offering to express our gratitude towards you. What we give to you is just a small portion of what you have given us. But with this offering, we would just like to let you know how thankful we are of having you as our Heavenly Father. Help us to be generous towards you in the same way you have been generous towards us. May you take pleasure in our offering today. And may this money be used wisely for the building of your kingdom. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.